religious liberty is not at risk in, say, Australia in the same way as it is in some other countries. So if you had a communist government which excludes religion or alternatively controls and licenses the only expression of religion, for example, Chinese, you know, state-run churches, for instance, uh, nor is it at risk as it is in some other countries with, for example, uh, theocracy, where you've got a majority Muslim population, which is also the government. Um, so you know, that, that's not all Muslim countries by any means, but there are some with that, with that expression. Um, or alternatively, you've got one very dominant religion which marginalises and puts legal or de facto limits on the adherence of other religions. So that would be, say, the case in India where it's difficult to be a non-Hindu. Mm. Uh, and becoming more difficult by the day. Yes, correct. We so should learn from that. We should learn from that, absolutely. So there are those other countries where you could say they're much, much worse on, um, on religious liberty than Australia. But yes, religious liberty is under threat in another way in Western liberal democracies. And that, I think, is, is largely because of this. Uh, it's because of a competition, I think, between what you might call a, a secular view, a secular worldview versus a religious worldview. It's because of a competition between uh, what Carl Truman would describe as, as a culture of expressive individualism, where my identity is self-determined and particularly might be based on my sexual identity and sexual self-expression. And that is antithetical to the foundation of a religious worldview where my identity is based on my relationship with a creator and what the creator expects of me to live. And they're just very difficult to put together those two views. And so if we have intolerance between those views and it is the um, uh, the secular and expressive individualism uh, worldviews that are making the laws, then they will tend to oppress um, the religious worldview. And that is what we're seeing to an increasing extent. So just, let me just give you a few examples, if I may. So. Um, uh, you, you might think that, that it's still not a problem. Well, uh, we have a case, for instance, we have a several cases where uh, a young woman in Sydney was sitting in a cafe reading her Bible and praying quietly, not, not saying anything, and was asked by the cafe manager to leave because they don't have Christians there. Now, there is no law in New South Wales which prevents someone from being discriminated against on the basis of their religious belief or activity. Uh, similar case in Canberra. Um, there was a cafe case, that is. Um, uh, a young woman called Madeline was sacked during the same-sex marriage plebiscite. She was a contractor to a, um, a party entertainment company. Uh, when she wrote on her Facebook page, and this is all she wrote, it's okay to vote no in the same-sex. she was sacked for that. She was sacked for that. And more than that, her boss called her a homophobe and a bigot. And I could not tolerate having a homophobe and a bigot in my workplace. And you might ask who was uh, demonstrating bigotry in that particular example. Um, but she had no... She had no recourse under uh, anti-discrimination law because she was a contractor rather than an employee. And she was a young woman. She was like early 20s and it was very difficult for her to do that. Um, we had, uh, well, the, the known, well-known case of Archbishop Porteous in the Catholic Archbishop in Tasmania who published the booklet put out by all of the Catholic bishops on, uh, called um, on, on Marriage to Parents of Students in Catholic Schools, so to, only to their own community. Uh, and that book, uh, booklet set out the traditional Catholic teaching on uh, marriage and sexuality, which has been around for 2,000 years. Uh, didn't say anything different, expressed it in moderate terms, but it was objected to by a person who was a transgender activist in Tasmania, uh, who was not a Catholic and did not have children at Catholic schools, but nevertheless found it to be offensive. Um, and under a very broad offensive conduct provision in the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Act, made a complaint saying, I was offended and people of... You, uh, LGBTI um, with, with LGBTI attributes would reasonably be offended by this statement of traditional Catholic doctrine and off to the Anti-Discrimination Commissioner. The surprising thing is that the Anti-Discrimination Commissioner took the case and then ran uh, compulsory mediation for nine months, uh, taking up a fair amount of time and resources for the Archbishop. And then after nine months, the, uh, the complainant, the transgender activist, dropped the case and said, I, I can't fight the Catholic Church, they're too strong. I mean, it should never have been in an anti-discrimination tribunal in the first place. It was simply a statement, a moderately expressed statement of a traditional religious view. Likewise, people shouldn't be dragged to a tribunal because there's a moderately expressed statement of transgender views. That's, that's, this is my point about tolerance. We just, we need to have tolerance. So, uh, and there have been people who have lost their jobs because they have expressed um, there was a, a university lecturer in, uh, in WA who uh, part of her contract was not to go proselytising, which is fine, um, but she had some uh, students who would constantly use Jesus Christ as a, 
as a swear word or expression. And so at one point, having got a bit sick of that, she said, uh, when they were doing that back and forth, I think they knew that she was getting triggered by that. Uh, she said to them, do you know Jesus? I know Jesus. That was all she said. Complaint, discipline proceedings. What was the nature of the complaint? Uh, well, offence, unsafe, proselytising. What, because somebody says they know Jesus, that's offensive? Yes. That's somebody else? Well, according to, according to that university, there was a student in, um, Goodness. in another university, so this is a student, not a lecturer, who... Uh, who, who prayed with a friend who wasn't a Christian, but you know that was he said, "Can I pray for you?" She said, "Yes, that was fine." The next day, he was called over by that person and her friends and said, "You're a Christian, aren't you?" "Yeah." Uh, "Yes," he said. Um, uh, "What would you do if you had a friend who was gay? Do you, you don't believe in in, in uh, gay sex, do you?" And his response was, um, "In in my religion, we think uh, sex should be between a man and a woman in marriage, and not not outside." So no, I don't I don't agree with that, but. If this person is my friend, I'm going to love them and be a good friend to them. That was what he said. Uh, complaint was made to student services and he was suspended from his course. So, yes, there are real examples. Because of, he defended. Yes, it was, un, and it was unsafe. He had made them feel unsafe, unsafe. Unsafe. Now, how that sort of statement makes anyone feel unsafe, I don't know. But it's, that's, it's what the point you're making, John, is about the level of sensitivity to what is and is not a permitted view to be put in, well, the public square or a university class or the cafe at university campus, whatever it is. And it's, it's just the absence of tolerance. It's intolerance. And it's intolerance which is then backed by administrators or by the law in the case of the anti-discrimination tribunals. So that they're the types of incursions of um, religious liberty. I also need to say there are plenty of examples of anti-Semitism and um, Islamophobia as well. There was a young woman who was refused uh, admission to a Sydney hotel because she was wearing a hijab. So it's like, why? There's no basis for that. Um, so we do have anti-religious bigotry in Australia, uh, and that is the because coming from the secular, coming from an expressive individualism, coming from a sort of a, an agenda of advancing progressive sexual libertarianism, all identified as being antithetical to a, a traditional religious worldview, that's the clash. And that's, the, that's where the tensions are, I think, about religious, not all of them, but that's where a lot of the tensions are about religious liberty in this country. You're really painting a picture here of what might be called competing human rights. Yeah. So we don't seek a cooperative model. I'll compete with you for my rights. Yes. Which is hardly conducive to a harmonious society. No. It's almost as though the law is creating a, a, a fertile place for more activism and more lawfare. Yes. Which I would suggest has been the problem, that, that we've had 40 or 50 years of more and more and more discrimination law, but it's less and less harmony, the very opposite of what I'm sure some well-intentioned people initially hoped it would, would produce. Mm. I, I, it, ha it has been the case uh, well, let me start another way. I think anti-discrimination law has uh, had played an important role in our society. I think it was very important for dealing with, uh, or is one way of dealing with racial discrimination, one way of dealing with sex discrimination for the advancement of women, uh, age discrimination and disability discrimination. Um, when you start to get into issues of saying you can't, because we've just kept adding in protected attributes, we've, you know, race, gender, age, disability, not likely to generate too many controversies for most people. But then we start adding in things like political belief or religious belief or lawful sexual conduct. And you can immediately see that within society, people are going to have different views about what's appropriate sexual conduct. I mean, the Australian Cricket Board had two different views in respect of a cricketer recently. <laughs> so we, you know, and once those things are out there, the question is, why is the law and an anti-discrimination tribunal or a court going to make judgments about what is and is not appropriate speech or conduct in those sorts, on those sorts of attributes? So, so to answer your question, um, the addition of those attributes and the in, in putting in offensive speech type laws into anti-discrimination legislation has taken what is, I think, a basically good idea, anti-discrimination law, but turned it into the venue, the venue for, for the culture wars. Mm -hmm. So it becomes the legal expression of some of the culture wars now. Did you enjoy this episode? 
We cannot get good public policy out of a bad debate. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe and join the conversation.